Welcome back to Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm your instructor, David Leitner. Today, we're going to talk about archaic Homo sapiens behavior. Um, we haven't talked a ton about behavior up until now. We started to a little bit with Homo erectus, but we're part of the reason is that, you know, until stone tools come along, we don't have a lot of material culture to infer behavior from. Um, with... Uh, Archaic Homo sapiens, we actually start getting a lot more material culture, and uh, it tells us even more about their day-to-day -day lives. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, hunter-gatherers, modern hunter-gatherers, may be a good model to look at when we look to the possible behaviors of um, archaic Homo sapiens. We know that archaic Homo sapiens were certainly living on probably a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They lived in those sorts of situations. Um, and they have large enough brains that we are approaching the complexity of modern humans, maybe already have reached it. That's a question. Um, so at, at least somewhat, we may be able to use modern hunter-gatherers as a proxy for some of the things we can't otherwise see uh, in the fossil record. But we have to bear in mind there are limitations to this. Modern hunter-gatherer societies, forager societies, are not frozen in time. They are not fossil humans. Um, they have continued to evolve just like all of us, um, they continue to adapt new technologies, invent new technologies, come up with new ways of living all of the time. So we shouldn't sort of look at them as sort of this frozen in time model that we can just sort of look at like a window to the past. That's not what that's for. Rather, we can look at the conditions they live in, the limitations that those uh, and opportunities that those conditions present for these people and how these people have solved those um, those puzzles, those problems. Um, uh, remember, most of the material culture of modern hunter-gatherers doesn't show up until uh, very late in the Paleolithic. Bows and arrows are extremely recent, for instance, but are widespread in many societies. Not every, but many. Um, so, uh, so bear that in mind. We're not looking to modern hunter-gatherers because they are just like archaic peoples. Rather, they live in conditions that may be similar to what those people lived in and may give us clues to the problems that they would face day to day and how they might solve them. One of the chief pieces of material culture that we have from this era called the Middle Paleolithic or the Middle Stone Age is stone tools. And the stone tool industries that predominated during this time were mostly built around prepared core techniques like the Mousterian industry and the Levallois industry. You know, a lot of these are have French names because a lot of the early research on stone tools was done in France. Um, so... Uh, but that by no means means that these types of tool industries were limited just to those areas. Um, characteristic of these uh, industries, remember the the Acheulean industry d is distinguished from the old one by the fact that there is retouching done. Uh, in other words, the, the shape of the hand axe is roughed out, and then uh, you prepare the edge by dulling it, and then strike it with a soft hammer. Well, there are more of these soft hammer techniques in the Middle Stone Age industries. Um, uh, we start to see variations that look like local stylistic differences, uh, and we start to see the use of flakes as scrapers. So smaller flakes become used as ways to scrape hide uh, and other things. Uh, I'm going to try and show you this movie here. I hope it works. Uh, it's in French. Don't panic. You don't need to know French to make this work. Uh, really, uh, I just want to show you what the Levallois technique entails and why it is so interesting. So basically, 
the Levalois technique requires a prepared core that is given a final sort of strike at the end to produce the tool. Uh, but all the work up to then is about shaping the core to get that final piece. So you can see here, working the stone, this is a piece of flint, working it on both sides, carefully choosing where uh, they're going to strike. And you notice when they strike, they're not just banging them together. There's a particular technique you have to do use. Okay, here they are refining that shape a little bit. They've got sort of the rough shape. Now they are trying to sort of get a pattern of ridges that will be about what they want. Each of those flakes there is surgical sharp. I mean, it's a sharpish surgical steel. Okay. Now we've got something that is approaching what they want. So the final step involves building a flat striking surface that um, we will dull again so that the, um, uh, the amount of pressure it takes to fail is going to be extremely high, which is going to lead to a longer, thinner flake. getting those last little bits set up. Notice how carefully he's evaluating it after every strike. Okay, here comes the dulling. This is going to be the striking surface here. And there, one final strike, and you end up with a tool with an extremely long, extremely sharp cutting edge. Look at that. What's really interesting about this time period, too, is we have the invention of compound tools. So combining tools, combining the stone tool with the uh, with other organic material to come up with innovative tools, like this axe. de peau souple ou maintenu dans une poignée de cire ou de bitume, le potentiel de cet objet ne se révèle que lorsqu'il est emmanché. Il devient alors redoutablement Hafting it to the end of a stick like that gives you much more leverage and control, uh, which allows you to apply more force in a more accurate way. Look how quickly this cuts through this branch. Le débitage des clavalois marque un net progrès de la taille. As good as any steel hatchet. L'évolution humaine. C'est parce qu'il possède une parfaite maîtrise de la taille des roches dures que l'homme de Néandertal a pu conquérir, entre 300 000 et 35 000 ans, la quasi-totalité de l'espace européen. OK. So compound tools are a major innovation in this time period. So it's not only are these more complex uh, stone tool making techniques present, but also what you're doing with those stone tools is very different. Um, Binding with pitch or sinew, in that case, they were just using um, green bark uh, as a kind of twine, uh, But though we also have much more complex, evidence of more complex bindings as well. Like I say, using pitch, which has to be synthesized through a heating process uh, using tree sap, uh, and sinew has to be processed from the tendons of um, of, uh, of animals. Uh, these are all multi-step processes. They are complex. They're not sort of obvious necessarily. Uh, so they have to have been learned. They have to have been taught from one person to another. So we've got very good evidence again of some kind of communication. Uh, the, remember, the Shulian tools all share a shape which indicates there must be some transmission of this idea across distances here. 
Well, we've got a similar thing going on here. People are having to teach the techniques to each other in order to pass them down, in order for them to spread. Uh, some of our best evidence for these compound tools comes from uh, Schöningen in Germany. And uh, the evidence there is we actually have four uh, complete spears, uh, a throwing stick, which is an atlatl, which is an, um, also an amazing invention at this time, uh, and three worked branches that haven't been turned into tools yet, but are ready to, to be transformed. Um, the atlatl is a great um, tool. It is a long stick with a little... Um, uh, a little pro uh, projection at the end that goes into the end of the spear and you hold it up so that the end of the spear is back here, right? And it goes forward and then you throw releasing the spear as you throw it. Um, the, uh, the advantage of this is you're basically creating a much, your arm is a lever and you're essentially extending the length of that lever, which means you're extending the speed the amount of force you're putting behind that spear, which makes it fall uh, fly faster, straighter, and with more force. Um, it's an incredible invention. Again, not an obvious thing. So what were they hunting? Well, uh, whereas it's likely that um, uh, there was still some small game hunting going on. Excuse me. Big game hunting is finally a part of the diet. We have good evidence of this, uh, particularly in cold regions like in Europe and parts of Asia. Um, the advantage here is for the amount of work you do, you get a lot more calories. Uh, and if it's cold enough, you have to worry less about the meat going bad. Uh, so um, you also are able to then reap other major uh, resources from that animal. The, uh, in the case of a mastodon, you have these incredibly long bones, you have tusks, uh, you have uh, a large amount of hide that you can use to cover a dwelling or create clothing, though we don't have evidence that they actually were doing either of those things, sadly. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so going after big game is a big change, because really the only things that go after big game are like those European lions that you see down there. Yes, there were lions in Europe. Uh, also horses. See the European horses there. Uh, and rhinoceros. Uh, we have lots of mid-Pleistocene sites where the we have large animal bones that have cut marks on them. And, uh, and so that's... Or, or also some evidence of Shulian artifacts nearby. So we know that stone tools are somehow associated with cutting those bones, probably. In addition, you know, it's one thing if you have bones with cut marks on them, okay? That could be hunting. It could be scavenging still. In Schöningen, uh, all of those spears and everything that were found were also found with the remains of ten butchered horses and flake tools that were clearly used to be deflesh the hides uh, and the bones in some cases. In Boxgrove in the UK, uh, there are bones with tool marks underneath tooth and claw marks. So that's the opposite of what we saw um, with the Aldewan industries, with the Homo habilis and the like, uh, who were scavengers. We now have the tool marks there first, the scavengers second. The animals get to it second. Uh, so the only way you get to the meat first is if you hunted it and killed it yourself. Finally, of course, let's talk about fire again. We know Homo erectus probably had it. Weirdly, we don't have a lot of evidence for it here. Um, why is that? Um... When we do find evidence, it's uh, all the evidence we have are sort of ash deposits and some burnt bone, which is useful in and of itself. I mean, what do you do when you have a campfire? What do you do with your trash? You throw it in the campfire. 
Um, but we don't have any signs of regular use. We don't have any signs that they had permanent settlements uh, or even semi-permanent settlements that they would return to year after year, uh, which is something we see later on. Um, so uh, we also don't have signs of permanent homes, and they weren't using caves as shelter very much. Uh, that's also very rare. So when we find them, we're not finding them in these areas. Um, all that means is that they were probably nomadic in nature. So they would sort of fall around, especially in Europe, where they're living on the edge of the ice sheets much of the time. They're probably following the uh, herds of large animals that they re depend upon and aren't staying in any one place for an extended period of time. All right, so that's a peek at Archaic Homo sapiens behavior. Uh, next, I'm going to start talking about the Neanderthals. I love this subject. Neanderthals are my favorites. I think I'm biased, uh, <laughs> probably, but I think they're the best uh, uh, hominins of all. Um, uh, I find them absolutely fascinating. I hope you will, too. Until then, take care of yourself, have a good week, and I will see you soon.